as a white boy in the United States, your degree of risk taking and what that's viewed as is different than my degree of risk taking and what that's viewed as. This is Charlie Gilkey. He is the man that people turn to to figure out how to get more shit done. But if you spend even a second with Charlie, you'd realize that this man is so much more. He is a cross between an entrepreneur, an army officer, and a philosopher. And while I'd like to say we talked about productivity, ooh, we talk about topics that people are afraid to talk about, but 100% we need to hear. All the presidents were white. Like everywhere you look as a white boy in the United States, you see symbols of yourself succeeding and leading and being on top and people like being moguls and being Carnegie's and being all of those things. If you are, are a kid of color, you don't see that. And so it's hard to believe that you can be something if you don't see people like yourself doing that thing. And this is the unfortunate truth. With the way the game is, being mediocre will not cut it for you. So Charlie, one thing I have heard you say time and again, and it like, it so hits me in my heart is the idea that the things that matter most to us are the things that we happen to spend the least amount of time on. And as entrepreneurs or as creatives or as leaders, I think we've all experienced this idea that we want to do big, awesome things, but they seem to always fall onto the back burner. How can that be? You know, that's an interesting question for me. It's, it's one, I have two guiding questions that, that have really been, you know, what I wake up in the morning at, at Productive Flourishing and thinking about. It's like, one, why don't we do the things that matter most to us, right? We know why we don't do the things that don't matter or we don't want to do. That's easy, right? But the things that truly matter. Um, and so the other one is what makes teamwork so hard for some people? Right, because oh, when you wow, think I about suck it, at that one too. We'll, we'll put that one. We, we might pick up that one, right? But because these things that it turns out that we're wired to want to do, we're, we want to do our purposeful, impactful, creative work. All of the motivational schemas are lined up for that on the personal side, and yet we struggle. That's interesting. And on the team side, it's like we are evolutionarily wired to want to rock with other people and to win with them, and we want our teams to win. And yet we struggle. That's, that's super fascinating to me when you think about it. It's it's an apparent contradiction, right? Okay, but you're like over a decade into this, right? And we can get into your career in terms of starting the military and and getting right, and going and studying all the weird things you studied. But you've spent so much time focused on these two challenges. So do you have the answer for us? I do. I have. Um, oh, good. Okay. I'm broad, glad. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> so I'll start on the personal side. But it turns out it works for the team side as well. So let's talk about the air sandwich real quick. Okay. So imagine your big dreams, your big goals, like how you want your life to be as the top slice of bread. Okay. And then let's imagine the bottom slice of bread being your day-to-day -day reality and what your schedule actually looks like and all the stuff that's got you tied up on any given day. For a lot of people, there seems to be a big gap between those two. It seems like a lot of air between where we want to be and what we want to do and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's called the air sandwich, but that's an illusion. In between that top slice of bread and the bottom slice of bread are five chief obstacles that get in the way all the time. So obstacle one, competing priorities, right? Um, you you want to do that and you want to do that and you can't do both at the same time. What are you going to do? Right. Oh, only only two. I like there are 14 things I want to do. <laughs> well, yeah, you're 14. You know, if you're ADHD, that's 14 with like another three that's somewhere hidden around there. So it's like 72, but you don't know whether it's and one that's not or even 14. accounting for the, the shiny things that just happen to come up and, and take me off my path even. Yeah. And so um, competing priorities is one. The second thing is head trash. And head trash is a macro sort of word for like your limiting beliefs, your upper limit problems, the cultural nonsense that we inherit and get socialized into, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves from that sixth grade teacher that said we sucked at math and then we learned and actualized that we suck at math. That's head trash. Then you have the third piece, which is no realistic plan. All three of those words are important. We might want to unpack them, but I'll just say no realistic plan. The fourth piece is too few resources. 
you don't have enough time, maybe you don't have enough money, maybe you don't have enough attention, maybe you don't have the right contacts. There's always some obstacle, right, if you know that reference. And then the fifth one is poor team alignment. And on the personal side, this one confuses people because they think I mean the other side, but I mean the team that's around you, your family, your friends, your community, your coworkers, all of those at a macro level or team. And largely what happens is we haven't either enrolled or told people what we truly want to do. And so the team around us can't help us and actually, unfortunately, pull us in different directions and exacerbate the problem. So those are the five keys, or excuse me, the five obstacles that really keep us from doing our best work. And usually it's at least one of those in play, but yeah. usually it's multiples of those. Usually it's all five. Yeah. <laughs> if you really work hard, I mean, so, so it's so interesting to me because I've realized in studying some of the most successful entrepreneurs and creatives and reading memoirs and reading, hearing their stories, and even in my own life mirrored to me, I've realized that the number one thing that tends to hold us back is we're not getting specific enough with what we want. Mm -hmm. I, I was at a conference, I was at a Tony Robbins conference back in 2018 with my friend Evan Carmichael. And I'm working through some of these exercises and the guy across from me because we were in this very special area because Evan happens to get us into these special areas. But the guy who I'm working with is the godfather for some of the kids in Tony Robbins' organization. Like he's been invited out and he is, seems to be extremely successful. He looks successful. He sounds successful. And we're working through this exercise. And he goes, Mark, 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 stop. You don't know what you want. And I go, no, 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 like, blah, 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 blah. and I'm like, he's like, no, no, he's like, you don't know what you want. You, you just, you just, it's so clear to me. You don't know what you want. And that struck me in that moment because I realized, oh yeah, there's just, com so competing priorities. And then flash forward four years of me working on this and me realizing that figuring out what you want is the most important thing you can do to start with. And I'm at a conference. I'm at a ClickFunnels conference in, in Orlando in September this year. And I'm talking to someone and we're getting to know each other. And he goes, you know what's remarkable at you, Mark? You have too many opportunities. Like, I believe you would be good at anything you do. But I just feel like you need to choose something. And I'm like, oh, back to you don't know what you want. And so I think that many of us really, you know, achievers entrepreneurs, creatives, we think of competing priorities perhaps as maybe other people's priorities. But I think the thing that holds us up the most is the fact that we would probably be pretty good at anything we did. We just need to pick something, right? Yeah. I will often say for my um, coaching clients who are, whether they're executives or, or founder owners, I would tell them the hardest question I'm going to ask you is what do you really want? Like not what do you want, but what do you like really want? It's going to be the hardest question every time because the first ways are asked was like, well, I want, you know, I want to grow my business or I want my team to do X or they'll throw out all these sort of those top level wants, but that's not really what they want, right? There's something deeper. And this is especially the case for women and people of color. It's even, it's even harder because, you know, we and they are not socialized to actually be able to orient your life by what you want, right? Your life is oriented based upon how you can take care of and serve other people's things. Why and is so, that? Why is that socialization there? Well, we socialize women in our society to be supporting actors in other people's stories. And so when you look at all the kin keeping and relationship keeping and kid keeping and family keeping, so much of that stuff is socialized to be normed to be put on women. Right. And so we guys often don't think about that when we're thinking about our day to day reality and that like, you know, I'm not sure what you and your partner's relationship is, but if the kid's sick at school, who gets the call? Right. If parents get sick or need help, who gets the call first? And even when they're your own parents, oftentimes they'll call your partner and try to get support because that's how we socialize girls and who then become women and mothers and things like that. And so there's this deep, deep pressure for women to always be taking care of other people. And so it's a radical act of sovereignty and permission for them to say, this is actually what I want. Abstract from everything else. This is what I want. Why would minorities or people of color also be conditioned in this way? Is it, is it just a lack of perceived opportunity or, or people to model? So let's go back to third grade and 
history or geography. And you're looking along. Yeah, Mrs. Kaja. She was my third grade teacher. Did you, did you have all the presidents going along the wall? Right. Uh, so I'm Canadian. Oh, but, Canadian. But third grade was actually really hard because my teacher asked me, and this story came up. My teacher asked the class, who is our prime minister? And I said, George Bush, who was the president at the time. And everyone laughed at me. Oh, I'm sorry. And I realized my mistake. And my teacher stopped and said, no, this is, this is really important. Our, our prime minister is Brian Mulroney. But this shows how as Canadians, we're so influenced by American culture. That's the lesson she tried to teach. The lesson I got from this is don't be so quick to answer <laughs> because everyone's going to laugh at you if you make a mistake. But anyway, grade three, grade three, grade three. Um, so I'll talk about the American experience. I'll locate, I'll localize that on the American experience. Many um, minorities and people of color, though we're told like you can be anything you want. When you look at the actual examples that you have, you have entertainers, you have athletes, you have um, those types of things. And even those are doing an activity to please or perform for other people. Right. And even when you love it, there's still that sort of thing going on that it's really about learning to do that. And so you learn from that perspective. But the, the thing I was going to go and I would use this because, you know, someone who was in a um, DEI workshop that I was attending mentioned that as a third grade white boy, right, he looked around the wall and all the presidents were white. Like everywhere you look as a white boy in the United States, you see symbols of yourself succeeding and leading and being on top and people like being moguls and being Carnegie's and being all of those things. If you are, are a kid of color, you don't see that, right? You see your, you know, you see your people doing different things because of the way our society is set up. And so it's hard to believe that you can be something if you don't see people like yourself doing that thing. Yeah, that sounds so obvious. Yeah. And yet uh, so crushing. Yeah, this is where I mean, not to unpack, I don't know where we're going today on this one. But this is where when you like a lot of folks didn't understand how big a big deal of like the first Black Panther was, right, the movie, because it was the first movie to where there was an entire arc of the movie focused on Wakanda. And it was the first movie where white people were actually the visitors to a strange and powerful land not minorities and people of color and black people going to the advanced, civilized, overpowerful white nations and being basically the barbarians in that scenario. And if I can extract this, you tell me if this is fair or not, because mm -hmm. I know that your dad was a black man, mm -hmm. grew up in a very different culture in a very different world mm -hmm. in Alabama. Is that where Arkansas? You're from? Arkansas. And so, I, I mean, I'd, I don't even want to imagine just the, the prejudice and, and the lack of opportunity that he faced at that time in that world. But can I extract this to say that, you know, regardless of, uh, and we have a global audience. So mm -hmm. regardless of where you may grow up or your cultural background or your socioeconomic background, or whether you're a minority or a majority, at some point, you're going to bump up against something if you want to do something where you have to go out and try and find the, the person who's done it, find the person to model, go out and find, like, I'm, I'm very fortunate, right? I grew up in Toronto, which is a fairly wealthy area in an upper middle class white family mm -hmm. as a straight male. So I kind of, and I'm not bragging, I'm very aware of my privilege. So I'm kind of like checking a whole bunch of like mm -hmm. privilege boxes here. And I notice it, especially with my daughters who don't quite have the same things I've had or my friends, my friends who come from different backgrounds or the couple who had to escape the USSR in the middle of the night to try and go to Italy for a bunch of things in the 80s to get ushered to a whole new country. And suddenly I'm like, whoa, my world is not the same world as everyone else's. But regardless of where you are or your upbringing, the, the road to success is doing the things that don't come naturally to you. So mm -hmm. we all have to go out and try and model other people. Is that is that fair or am I now... It's fair, and some of us have different, the race is different. And, and I know that sounds generalized, but there are plenty of studies that show that for the same degree of qualifications for blind resumes and things like that, the name of the person determines whether or not they're going to get the callback. The very same, so if you're like Mark Drager and you send that, that's one thing. But if you're like, you know, Mario Gonzalez, right? Same degree, same background, it's like, mm, maybe not, right? names, culture, everything is loaded in that same way. And again, this is not Charlie making it up. I'm sure Mark will provide the show notes, but this is a known known, right? So it's not just, 
oh, we, you and I have to run the same race and it's hard. It's when we look at the fact that we, most of the games we play are in the intersubjective reality, the realm of intersubjective reality. So I need to unpack that for a second. So um, in Sapiens, he wrote, I think his name is Nuval Harris. It comes in Sapiens, it's the name of the book. Um, he talked about three different kinds of reality. So there's objective reality, which most people think is the only reality, right? Which is like, you know, stuff exists out there, a rock is hard, right? Those types of things, right? There is a sun, it's an objective reality, it doesn't matter whether you or I believe it. There's subjective reality, which is just how you feel. Like you might like coffee, I might not like coffee. The re it's true, the reality is that, you know, like, it's true, but there's nothing true of the world about that except for of Mark's experience, okay? Most of the games we play as humans that really matter to us are intersubjective games. They exist because you and I agree they exist and they're valuable. So if I take my American dollar, you know, little green, you know, cotton paper, and I say, yeah, hey, Mark, yeah, here yeah, you yeah, go. Right here. I got yeah, you, you got one right you there. You and I American agree that has value, right? Right. And it only has value because you believe it does and I believe it does. Yep. Okay. That's the only reason it has value. Now, well, now this, this has more value. That has more value. So he's showing me 50 Canadian dollars right now. Now, here's the funny thing. It has more value in a global state. But if I walk down to my convenience store with yeah, a $50 with, Canadian. With a $50 Canadian, they'd be like, like, what is this monopoly money? You know, like, no, this is not money, right? This is not valuable to me. And that's how this works. So, so many of the games where they're talking about winning in business, where you start talking about being a great husband, where you start talking about being a great friend, are intersubjective games. They're intersubjective realities that are super scripted upon what we perceive of the world, right? And so I've probably taken this way different directions you expected we'd go, but yes, it's true that you have to do things that are uncomfortable. It's also true that it's different for you in our society, largely speaking, I'm not saying all people, but your degree of risk taking and what that's viewed as is different than my degree of risk taking and what that's viewed as. Yes, yes, and I actually love where we're going with this because are you, are you familiar with the Matthew effect? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Matthew effect for our listeners are the, the, is the idea that those who have more gain more and those who have less uh, gain less. So, mm -hmm. so the rich get richer and the poor get poorer is a perfect example of that because and it's an effect that that is believed to be true because if you start out with a little more. And, and again, I, I feel bad. I don't know if I should feel guilty for saying all of these things because it feels like I'm bragging, but I'm not. At least I don't think I am. So for example, I went to a technical college that I paid for out of pocket. Mm -hmm. So I worked for 18 months between high school and, and college. And I was able to work ground maintenance. And I worked 40 hours a week doing hard labor. And I was able to earn enough money to cover for most of my college. And I could live with my aunt. So I gave up the dorm experience. And I got some money from my grandparents, which certainly helped, but it meant that I had zero student debt. Mm -hmm. And by having zero student debt, when then I went out and got a job, I could afford to internship for free. Mm -hmm. And by internshiping for free, I got experience over a year working for free that other people may not have gotten. And then I used that experience to get a paid job. And then I used that paid job to do this and to do that. And I, my wife and I, when we got married, I paid for her college because mm -hmm. we were getting married anyway. So I paid for her college. So we then find ourselves at 23 or 24 with zero student debt, mm -hmm. having already started our careers. Mm -hmm. And so when I started my agency at 23, I was able to take the risk on it because we had nothing to lose, but we also had no debt. Mm -hmm. And so I can go back and see how each step stacked upon each other. The, I could take these risks that maybe others couldn't mm -hmm. because of luck because of work yeah. because of planning I, I don't know like because of things so the rich get richer the poor get poorer and this is this is why i find this conversation so interesting though it can be that we go the world shouldn't be this way things mm -hmm. should be easier and we can pour all our time and effort into getting upset that the world is the way it is mm -hmm. or we can say the world is the way it is now what do i have to do to not fall victim of it yeah there are a lot of different approaches. And so let, let's paint the story out. So I love that trajectory. So I ended up in a lot of the same places in that same time frame. So I bought my first house when I was 26, right? I didn't have to pay out of pocket for school. Didn't have to do some of those things. My path to doing that was putting on a bulletproof vest and standing in the sand in Iraq. Yeah. <laughs> Very different than picking up dog, uh, 
you know, which is what I did for a year and a half. But yes. So that's one of those differences that we talk about is what's it take for people who come from a background. So I learned, it was, I was like 11 when I realized, like, wait a second, one of my friend's parents died and they got inheritance. They ended up with having more money. Everyone around us in my neighborhood, when your parent died, it cost the family more because there was no inheritance. There was no generational wealth. And we were in, in cycles of generational poverty, what we now call that, to where when my parents, because there wasn't retirement set up for my parents, in the middle of my life, I'm taking care of my parents, which means I'm not investing and, take, and building up generational wealth, which means if we had kids, they would not be the beneficiaries of that. They would not have this sort of pass along, which adds up to who can buy houses, who can afford school districts, who can do all this sort of thing. And again, I don't want to overplay that story. We're just unpacking how this all unfolds. And we're all in this race doing different things, but we have different starting places. We have different sort of things. And so this is where, this is probably going more down the this arc than you were intending to go. This is where when people think that Systemic racism and systemic inequality when it comes to people of color and women is a thing of the past. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's still playing. Like, you, we can point to our very different stories, <laughs> right? And not only is it that, I was recently, we were doing some fundraising for our app Momentum. And so, as you know, I got quite a few things going on. So I've got, you know, I'm a best selling book author, I've got a successful coaching business. I'm in a, I run in a pack of, you know, really highly successful people. I'm an advisor on a lot of different things. And it sounds like I'm bragging, but these are just facts, right? When we were going for pitching and they sort of saw our pitch and it was like, it's a really great pitch. I believe in the model, but I'm concerned you got too much going on. I'm concerned you kind of have too many businesses going on right now. And you're in a place where you can't say it. But after I got off that, I was like, huh, I've never really been in a scenario to where a white successful entrepreneur who typically has a bunch of businesses and has those same things doesn't get funded because they have too much going on. Usually that's a signal of success and being able to run multiple enterprises and being able to do a lot of things and execute well. In my case, I had too much going on. W women and people of color experience this quite a bit. The very same metrics, the very same game that you would normally see be interpreted in this intersubjective reality one way is interpreted differently. So you're always left wondering, like... But is the answer to, to use emotional energy and time and, and victim... You can't help but feel like a victim, but is it to rail against it or is it to just say like, I can't change any of this stuff. So how do I win? I think that's a false alternative. Being the victim is just saying, ah, I can't win and giving up. Right. Yep. Just being like, it's not there. You know, we're just going to drive on. It's, it's the other one. I think the third is something of like, no, let's actually talk about what's going on. I'm not going to let it to limit. Like my app is still growing. I'm still doing what I'm doing. Like, let, it's not going to defeat me. At the same time, I'm done being silent about it. Right. Because there's some other person that's going to become in the slip behind me and do the same thing. And maybe they don't have the level of resources and composure. Maybe they haven't done the things that I've done in the past. And it absolutely crushes them. Because those are the options. Like you can either get <laughs> defeated and just work it and grind and grind and grind. Or you can say, you know what? There are alternative ways. This is partially one of the reasons why Momentum, our app, is bootstrapped and self-funded. Because I know that the way I would need to navigate that game would be fundamentally different than my peers. Can I ask you a question with grace? So if I ask this improperly, mm -hmm. you understand what I'm asking as opposed to the words that come out? Mm -hmm. So is this confirmation bias on your side? Like race is such a hot topic issue because you've experienced so much negativity from it and you're aware of it so much that this sample size of one that passed on it, you're just attributing to this or? Yeah, if it were just me, then I might be like, ah, I see it that way, right? When you get enough stories of the same thing happening and how asymmetric it is, you're like, no, nah, this is a broader pattern. Okay. Right. And so again, if it was just me, it'd be one thing, but it's not just me. Right. Your response could be, well, are all of you seeing it this way? 
Um, and it's just the way that you're saying, but it's like, you know, possibly. And if you see enough patterns of things playing out and you like the game, here's the game. You do X, Y, and Z. You do X, Y, and Z. You don't get the outcome, but it's only people like you, right? Or it's only women. For other folks, they do X, Y, and Z. Outcome happens. You got to start wondering, right? Is it really that the game is X, Y, Z? Or is there some sort of ABC plus X, Y, Z? And if you don't have ABC, you're going to have, it, it, there's a different game you have to play. Okay, so what do you do? You, you don't let it stop you. Yeah. And and the reason why I'm both incredibly uncomfortable with the conversation right, we're having right now, and I think it could be possibly the most valuable conversation I've had this year, mm -hmm. especially for our audience, is you're right. We don't, we don't talk about this stuff and it's not fun and it's not entertaining or any of those things. And yet we are touching on something that holds huge proportions and segments of our society uh, from moving forward with things that could change the world. Ed Milet, I was at his book launch, The Power of One More. Um, and this is one of those moments I had where in May, you know, I'm feeling not great about mm -hmm. myself at the time. And I get to go down because of my network. I get to go down and help behind the scenes with Ed Milet's book launch. And so I'm in the green room with people that I look up to. I'm there, Dean Graziosi's there and, and Marie Folio's there and Jenna Kutchner and, and Ed Milet. And I'm working with them and I'm feeling like both grateful and not good about myself. And then my Uber ride to the airport, this amazing man picks me up. And it's him and his wife. And he's apologizing because as they open the trunk, um, his kids, his teenagers' shoes are there and my luggage is supposed to go there. And he's apologizing. I was like, dude, it's okay, man. I got four kids. And he's like, oh, really? I've got five. And my son was supposed to clean this basketball stuff up. And he, and he gets talking. And he's like, yeah, me and my wife are up from Fayetteville. We drove an hour. We're just trying Uber out. We're seeing how it is because I, I just, I got to support my family and I got to get out of this terrible work and this terrible job. And he's taking me to the airport and he's telling me about, oh, you're flying out. I have, I've never been on a plane before. I've been up to, I've been up to New York once. Mm -hmm. um, I visited some family. We drove up there and he's just the most amazing man and the most lovely man. And here I am feeling really down on myself because of what, I don't know, like some conversation didn't go well or I felt small in this group of legends and giants. And meanwhile, I know at the airport, I get to go to the first class lounge or the business lounge because, and I know that I'm going to fly business class home. Mm -hmm. And I know that I'm going to, like, I just, I just, it hit me. Like, I do not live in the same world as this man. And my version of like, oh, woe is me entrepreneurship is very different than this man who's testing Uber with his wife. So that way he can get out of a job that's going nowhere that he doesn't like. And this is his version of entrepreneurship. And I'm like, man, it's like, I just, I feel like I'm in a bubble sometimes. And so this is potentially the most important conversation because there are people listening right now and there are people who are watching this who are in different parts of the world feeling this way. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a Plato reference of turtles all the way down, um, but it's just how, how deep it goes. I was, I was doing some consulting with my client who um, lives in Nigeria and their company is in Nigeria. So I was flown over, did the overseas, and I was... Um, I landed in the Nigerian airport and there was a, you know, um, a body man that helped me get through the airport and helped me get to the car. And I'm driving down the highway. Actually, he's driving down the highway. I'm in the back because I'm a VIP, apparently. Right. Uh, so you have, a, you have a, like a handler. I have a handler. Right. But this is I'm, I'm so glad I had a net. I'm so glad I had a handler because it's a quite literally a different world. Right. But I'm driving down the interstate. and I look over. And there's one of these, if you've ever been to Africa or if you've been to Asia, you know what I'm talking about. There's this little like VW taxi bus thing. And there are like 18 people in there. And it's not like a big bus. This is like the normal, like Westie, you know, size, normal van. And there's just like a bunch of people. And I'm like, how are they all in there? And they're crammed on top of each other and things like that. And so I'm driving down and I'm thinking about the consulting and I'm thinking about the coaching I'm doing with, with my client. And I'm thinking about my world and my client's world as an American. And then I think about the world of the people that are in this car going down and where they're trying to go and who they're trying to be. And I'm not approaching this as I'm better than, 
But I'm like, how would most of what I can say, because I mean, they speak English, everything's great, but how would the conversations and the words that came out of my mouth land in their brains and theirs with mine? How do we talk to each other? Like, what's that common bond? I, obviously, I got there because there's just certain things we all care about, right? But that range of difference of worlds, right? And so I also inverted it as like, is it possible or what would it take for someone in that van to be able to get the opportunities I have had to be able to be sitting in this car? Is that possible? What does that look like? So we don't have to be defeatist about this. And I'm, you know, what I love about this podcast is we do hard things like have awkward conversations like this. We don't need to be defeated about it. And we don't need to ignore it. Neither one helps. But if you are playing the game and you have evidence or you have enough stories that point to the game being received differently for you. You don't have to gaslight yourself into believing like, no, nah, like, no, nah, the game is just different and that's okay. It sucks. You can change it, but you have to change it differently. If you are the person that the game is rigged for, pay attention, pay attention. Because if your mastermind groups are all people like you, like I know plenty of friends of mine, great, soulful white dudes, right? I love them to death. Who's in your mastermind crew? You look at it, all other white dudes, right? Or maybe there's like a woman or two to balance things out, you know? Right, but imagine the echo chamber in the world that you continue to build. So I ask you another hard question, Mark. Off the top of your dome, name as many black business authors as you can. Uh, I'm so bad with names. Uh, T.D. Jakes. Okay. Um, the hip hop preacher, Eric, uh, Thomas. Is that his last name? Thomas? Okay. Keep going. Black business, Les Brown. Um, I'm trying to think through my, through my shelf. Um, uh, Antonio Neves. Um, can, can I, can I put you there? <laughs> yeah. I was be <laughs> like, if you don't, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. Right. That's going to be another conversation. <laughs> Can I, can I turn around and look at my bookshelf nope. or is that cheating? Oh. Um, You're actually doing surprisingly well. Okay. You're doing surprisingly well. Now, I'm going to change the question. How many of those are bestsellers? I, I wouldn't even know. All of them? We'd have to go back and look, but I realized in 2019 when Start Finishing came out. I was like, it's 2019. And I'm above a list of like, and because other people were asking me other things, well, when we index it to black business authors, not just, you know, if we went the celebrity route, if we did all that sort of whatnot, there's a wider range of things. And if we went to, you know, social and race issues, we can name a lot of people too. If, if we went to professional sports, we could really open up that world, right? We could really open up that world, which is what I was saying previously. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you, but if you, you were. If, if you index it to just thought leaders and business leaders, who are writing about growing business and entrepreneurship and things like that, that world of best-selling authors gets incredibly small, incredibly small. I'm one of them. And I'm like, how am I on that? How am I on like a list of like 10 people? How, how does Johnny this... Wimbry? <laughs> okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep remembering. people. <laughs> You're going to keep remembering, but I want you to, right? Yeah. So that as we're thinking about, like, if you see the list of books that come out every year, the best books, like, all of these things matter, right? They all matter because what people, women, this is this is where one of, um, so um, Jada Selner, have you talked to Jada yet for her new book, She Builds? No. Okay, so Jada Selner would be one. Rachel Rogers would be another, right? Both in our ecosystem, one client, one, one just a colleague, right? There's so much around those types of books like She Builds, Everyone Should Be a Millionaire. Um, there's, oof, one second. Uh, you can't look at your bookshelf. You didn't let me do that. <laughs> um, well, my list is longer and I'm trying to make sure Aron, Hamilton, so on and so forth, where they're really writing about doing things from this perspective. And it's important, but it's also important because you have to think. Um, I have a, one of my really good friends, his son or his kids are mixed, right? And I was like, man, when I grew up, 
there wasn't an, like, I didn't know any authors or creatives or entrepreneurs, or I didn't know any of that. Like, it wasn't a world that existed for me. But we were hanging out, we were just ha like having a barbecue or something like that. And I was like, you know, I'm going to make sure to talk about what I do. Not from bragging about it, but so that these kids have a reference point. <laughs> Uncle Charlie is an author. Uncle Charlie is an entrepreneur, right? Or that my, my dad's friend, Charlie, that I've talked to, they, that's just what he does, which means, oh yeah, people like me, like us, that I know do these things too. It's a whole new world for them, right? Based upon me, because when I was their age, or when I went to college, there was no outlet for that. Like, it took me until I was like 19 to realize that the type of writing that I do could actually be something that one could have a career doing. I'm an essayist at heart, right? I'm a philosopher yeah. and essayist at heart. I, I think part of that is, I think part of that is the industry coming around too. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, well, and, and, and more possibilities and the internet and... It that's true, but I didn't even know that was things. a thing, though. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Even before internet, yeah, we, we can all build our own audiences to do that. But, like, I didn't realize that was an occupation. Yeah. Right? That that was even a thing that nonfiction authors... And, like, it sounds obvious to us now. But when you don't think, oh, there's actually a profession that creates the books that go into Barnes & Noble or the yep. bookstore... And I could be one of the people that are in that profession doing that thing. You just don't see that possibility. Products exist. You buy them. You become a consumer. This is where to go deep, deep with Plato. Like that's, this is where when you start talking about like the consuming class, right? Is that in okay. all sorts so, of things, there's crafters and consumers, but that's their role in society to be a consumer. So if, if someone's listening to this right now, what advice? I mean, talk about it. Mm -hmm. we, we can talk about it. We can get it out there. We can have their experience. I probably shouldn't keep couching or feeling guilty for sharing my experience because I mean it it is what it is, right? I I, I do feel I bad sometimes, about it. but <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> but if if you're listening right now, what are the steps that we take then? I mean, Tom Billu, I heard him at an event speak to I think a, an 11 or 12 year old young black boy, and and the advice he gave him was be so good, develop a skill, and be so good that it takes all of those things off the table. You know, and, and I can think of some of the most horrendous artists out there, the people who are the hardest to work with and the most difficult. But if they're really good at their craft and they're making people money, you know, people will put up with a lot of weird stuff. So I'm not sure if you would agree with Tom Bilyeu's advice or not. Just just that skill and talent and hard work and just be so good that it takes race off the table is the answer or not. But what what yeah. can people in our situation are? It's not my situation. What could people in this situation do? So I'm going to invert what Bill said. And this is the unfortunate truth. It's necessary for you to do that. It's not optional. But the way the game is, being mediocre will not cut it for you. Some of your peers can be mediocre and succeed. You cannot. And every woman and every person of color that just heard me say that's like, duh, Charlie, that's just how, how this is. So, and it's even, you have to be that, and you still might not win, but you have to be that no matter what. So do that. A lot of the clients that actually come to me at this stage of these same categories of folks that I'm talking about, we're having to actually unlearn that because they're overworking and burning themselves out and pushing them because all of their life they've heard, you have to be so good. No one yeah. can question you. Yeah. Right. And so it creates this very weird situation where you're like, I'm working my ass off and I got to do it because if I don't do it. I'm not going to win. Yeah. And I'm probably not winning anyways. <laughs> right. And so if I'm not, apparently I've done the thing they told me to do, be better than everyone else, but I don't seem to be getting the results that are better than everyone else. So maybe I need to work harder and then maybe I need to work harder. And maybe I need to work harder. So you got to be careful of that. Right. I'm not, I'm not trying to disagree with Bill. I don't know the context, but I know on my side of things as an executive coach and as a founder coach, there are a lot of folks suffering because of that very thing. What can you do is the question. One, we talked about being aware. Two, if you're in privilege, if you're in a place where you have privilege or you have that, be looking out, not in a place of patronizing, right? Not in a place of that. But if you walk into a decision-making room and everybody in that decision-making room looks like you, that's probably going to end up creating the very sort of thing that's in there. So just be like, 
hey, can we invite people on the podcast? Can we get some of the people in the room that this actually affects? Maybe we get out of making decisions for other people, right? And I think it's always about, um, well, it sounds trite, but we've been going there. Representation matters, right? Who's at the table? Who do you showcase? Who do you invite in? Who do you make an extra effort to amplify, to buy from if dollars are cheap or if dollars are scarce? All of these things matter. And as to our point, it's not that the people you might be buying from, the women and people of color, aren't as good. It's they may not be being seen to the same degree for a lot of different factors that are outside of their control. And doing this, making making an effort to do this isn't in itself racist or like here like if I see in, in my community, um, because I, I live in a place where we're transitioning from what was traditionally a fairly white community mm-hmm. to a really multicultural community. Now I live just outside of the Toronto area. Toronto itself has something like 60 or 70% of everyone who lives there was not even born in this country. So an extremely multicultural society. It has some good things. It has some bad things because people are comfortable with it. Some people aren't. That aside, if I see what I perceive to be maybe newer Canadians or new immigrants or people you know coming in, I work so hard to be extra nice. Mm-hmm. And then I think, am I being racist? Because now I'm like, now I'm like laying it on so thick. And so like, taking the time to go buy local and buy from a minority and do these things in itself, like it's, it seems so foreign. Is that in its, like, do you, do you understand what I'm asking? Is, is yeah, that in itself? It's, it's a version. We see this, especially you didn't go the reverse discrimination route, which thank you for not doing that. Here's the funny thing about race. I know we, I didn't know we were talking about this day, but we're talking about it. I didn't, I didn't know either because I thought we were talking about productivity, but, but this is, this is more important. <laughs> I think so. I have plenty of stuff on productiveflourishing.com about productivity. If you want to read about it, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we might get there, but it's really, really weird for me, right? Because things get emotional in it and really murky when we start talking about race. So a lot of folks, when we're talking about hiring and things like that, they're like, I don't know, it feels weird to like give people of color and women extra consideration, right? It seems like mm, maybe that's like racist or maybe are we being patronizing, but I'm like, hold on, hold on. So, and, when, and especially when it comes to recruiting and filling the pipeline, right? Cause I'm like, hey, if you, maybe you want to get a more diverse talent pool, maybe instead of always going to MIT, and always going to Harvard, maybe you go to the historically black colleges and university and recruit from there, right? And they're like, well, that feels weird to go there and do that. I'm like, so what you're saying is there is talent and people that you want at Harvard and MIT, and you have no problem going there to recruit them. But when there's talent and people that you want in these other colleges, all of a sudden it feels like, "Mm, maybe I'm being biased. You've been biased the whole time. You have been 100% biased the whole time. We're just asking you to equalize that or asking you to pay attention that the fact is that your your low volume pipeline for, for black and women talent or for people of color and women is low. And so you keep hiring certain types of people. It's like, where are you going to recruit them? Are you going to their communities and saying, hey, We would love for you to work at our organization. Not because you're black, not because you're a woman, but because you're a talented person and we know where you are. We're gonna come to you (laughs) and make sure that we have that conversation because it seems like that's the conversation you're having at Harvard. Seems like that's the conversation you're having at MIT and Stanford and all these other places. And they're like, oh, when we think about shopping local, right? Goes around a lot, shop local, shop local. Well, there's a way we can invert that and say, oh, well, you're being exclusionary or you're being nationalistic about your purchasing, right? And we can go that route, but we don't. We think it's a good thing to shop locally because of how it supports the community and how it does that. But when we say these same things about how we might address some of the inequities when it comes to you know, racial inequities or inequities between men and women or inequities between the hetero folks and the non-hetero folks, whatever sort of asymmetry, all of a sudden we get into sort of weird stories about identity politics and whether we're being racist or not. And it's just how complicated and awkward this conversation has become, right? It feels like none of us could do right and do well 
So we don't do anything or we just worry about it. None of that's helping, right? Have the awkward conversations. Yeah, maybe going to Brown to hire really great talent who might be from the African diaspora, depending on, based upon where they are. Maybe that is you prioritizing those, that talent pool. You're already prioritizing other talent pools. What you might be saying is there are people there that bring perspectives and talents and expertise that we would not otherwise get if we just hired from the same pool. Okay. That's what it's really about. It's interesting. I've heard a few things along the years that I've tried to hold on to. And one of them is that facts or truth uh, is never something to be afraid of. <laughs> it's never something to fear. I heard that from, um, I think, the daughter of a scientist. And I was like, ooh, I like that. Facts and truth are never something to be afraid of and fear. Just face them because they are what they are. <laughs> Another one of these tenets that I've really held on to is that diversity of perspective and experience will lead to maybe harder conversations and tougher collaboration, but better ideas. And if we are in the environment where we need to, where, where things are changing faster and faster than ever, and things are becoming more and more and more competitive, and we know at the end of the day that people is the thing that matters, and it's been proven... <sighs> I'm using the word proven, but I have seen it with business and I've seen it in all areas where it's like the who, not how, right? Like it's like, we need great people. What's the difference between this company and that company? What's the difference between this R&D department and that one? Or what's the difference between our growth and that? Like it comes down to people, 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 people. Why wouldn't you want a diverse group of people with diverse experiences with different points of view so that way you can arrive at the greatest ideas and breakthroughs like it just makes sense to me doesn't it doesn't make sense to you it does i mean there's there's a whole lot we can unpack there broadly speaking it does it's been shown time and time again right that these you know diverse teams diverse and inclusive teams just win better it's been shown um, well, not shown. It's been stated. I'll say it that way. I was, I was at a, who was, a, who was giving this talk? It'll come to me, but there was some other, of, um, some other business thought, they, thought leader that's um, a bit further along than I am when it comes to platform size. He was like, you know, let's just face it. Women are better managers by and large than men are, right? So when you look <laughs> at, when you look at the combination of technical skills and the soft skills that are required to be great managers, statistically, women tend to do better. Right. And it's like, we need to come to grips with that. Right. Yeah. I think it's really about diversity of talent. You are going to have more awkward conversations. You just are. Right. Um, because all of a sudden, a given in the, in the group of people like you is no longer a given. Right. Because different people come from different cultures where that's not an intersubjective given. Right. And so they're, you're just going to learn that. But that's part of, I think, this great journey of being human. And it's part of what's making the best work. And it's part of what allows those soul changing epiphanies of being in the back of a car in Nigeria and being able to look over and imagine someone else's world and understand that it's not that your world is the right one. It's that we're all sort of bumping through this world with eight billion different worlds trying to figure out how to do it well together, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it just softens so much of that and allows you to do that. But the also the benefit is if you do this with really, if you practice it, you'll also find those hard edges about yourself and your own head trash that you can let go of too, right? Because you're like, huh, I believe this thing, but that's not the only thing that I can believe about that. Right. I believe um, there's a meme in, in sort of personal development that like how you do anything is how you do everything. Oh, yeah. I, I hate that, that one. one. I hate I that struggle. one. It, it's a bad principle. It is 100 percent a bad principle. How I make a sandwich is not how I write. Right. How I show up for my wife it's not how I show up for some rando that just I saw down the street. Like, and you're like, oh, that's not what's meant. If you make it make sense, you get something like, oh, do things with intention. Well, that's a completely different principle, <laughs> right? <laughs> I actually asked Dan Millman about this, uh, the author of The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, because it was a big principle 
And I was like, I just struggle with it because I want to do things exceptionally well, but I get tired. Like doing absolutely every single thing, every single minute of every single day, as well as I can is just tiring. <laughs> and he's like, no, that's not what it's about. It's about intention. That, that was his very answer. And so I'm like, well, let's say it's about in- be intentional about things. Okay, great. Right. But the literal, the way, especially we do it on the internet, right? Like we read a principle like that and we take it as gospel. Whew, like someone said it. Right. But then that leads to burnout and regret and, you know, things like, so we have to be careful when we hold on to things like that, because that is one, that's a, that's a paradigm that comes from a a particular culture of things. I can unpack that if you want to, but we can say, is that actually true for me though? Right. I need to experience that. I need to play with that. And it may turn out that because who I am and what I've seen and what, like, there's a different way in which that thing, like if you're, like I come from a military culture, right? My family was in a military tradition. I went into the army myself. You, you all know that because he, he mentioned it earlier. There very much is a how you do anything is how you do everything principle there, right? I can attest that the stakes in a military environment are much higher, right? Than the stakes in a civilian environment. Like if you get out and you haven't checked the oil on your car or you, you know, you haven't checked the, the air pressure and you have a flat or, you know, your engine blows up. You call AAA. You call a mechanic. It's you're fine. Not, you're not being ambushed right. somewhere on the side of the road, stranded. Yeah, you do that in the sandbox, you got a problem, right? You got a real big problem, right? So those little details and how you did everything there mattered to a degree. So that context is super, super important. But when we hear advice, we forget our cultural context. We forget our, our practical context. And then we end up tying ourselves in knots. So that principle, how you do everything is how you do anything, sends people down the road of burnout and perfectionism and procrastination and poor expectations. And they don't ship what matters most because it turns out to do your best work, see what we're, see what we're doing here. We're actually getting back to, <laughs> back to. Yeah, yeah. I was, to, I was noticing how, how smoothly you were like, okay, so we talked about competing priorities and somehow you talked about head trash. And I was like, oh, wow, we're working, we're working back through these five things of, Competing in priorities, head trash, no realistic plan, too few resources, poor, poor team alignment. <laughs> yeah. So we're working back, right? Um, start finishing. I, I can say it now because the, the climate has changed. There are a lot of Trojan horses in start finishing. And one of the tro- uh, major Trojan horses is unpacking some of the characteristics of our culture that we've talked about there that lead us to perfectionism and burnout and feeling like we're not defective and we're not disciplined enough. And we are fundamentally broken because if we were these excellent creatures, that did everything with a, such a degree of precision and character and things like that, then we would have these outcomes, right? And that's what we all bake in. <laughs> Let me throw this by you because because yeah. I've been able to do this on our other conversations and you always handle these things so well. So when I was growing up, I didn't really have a, a male role model in my house. My mm-hmm. grandfather was my greatest male role model, but my dad and my mom separated when I was quite young. And then when I was eight, seven or eight, my mom remarried and, and the man was very abusive and an alcoholic and um, a rageaholic and all these things. But growing up, it was my sister who's older than me, my mom and my aunt. And so um, I remember like weird things like my dad used to get mad that I called underwear panties because that was like such a girl thing to do. And it was just like, I was just a boy in a household of women. Mm -hmm. And part of it is I realized looking back that I am and have been just a very sensitive man because of that. But I also believe that you're know, like, I don't like sports. I'm not super competitive. I'm not, you know, I say like, I'm not a manly man kind of thing. Um, but I just think that those first seven or eight years of growing up in a household of women around women made me bring on a lot of um, maybe maternal or, or feminine um, virtues or whatever. But I don't think that bothers me. It holds me up a little bit, but I also know that our greatest strengths are our greatest weaknesses. Mm-hmm. And if that's true, then the inverse is also true. Your greatest weaknesses are probably also your greatest strengths. So I don't necessarily let me this bother me, but do you think there's something to like, you know, especially amongst maybe minority communities where you're of the generation of single moms working super hard, raising people? Like, do you think just the fact I grew up with women would have maybe even brought me up that way? And Maybe I'm more sensitive because of it, but also that this is a huge strength of mine, perhaps. 
Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. I would say yes to all of them. Um, obviously, I want to be careful. I don't speak for all of a of any community or any. Yeah, woman, and you're so. also not a, <laughs> yeah. a and, practicing and, psychiatrist or anything. Yeah. Either. So, but no, who you're around matters for development, right? In your community that you grew up with, there was probably more of a range for you to practice your masculinity than there might be in other groups, right? Um, where I grew up, you did not want to be a feminine boy. Right. That was not a thing. Right. And, you know, there's other communities like that, too. So there's just a different degree of latitude and freedom of expression when it comes to that. And luckily, there is, we're reaching a point to where a lot of what we can call the toxic masculinity that, that, that has been passed down is either softening or changing or it's just not the way that it was like the way my dad was with his friends, no matter what community they came from, right, is fundamentally different than the way that I am with my male friends, right? What we say, what we do is just a different world. Now, maybe I've chosen well, but I think even like there's just different, like I was thinking about this. I'll be brief on this. I was, I was eating at a um, Black Bear Diner here in Portland and there was like this 65-ish year old man, uh, yeah, year old man, and he was doing like that elder flirting with the waitress thing right? That can, that they can oh, do. Oh yeah. You know what hey, I'm talking sweetie, about. And yeah. yeah and they're, they're sort of bannering back and forth and she seems to be performatively into it, or maybe she's really into it and they're just having a good thing. And I'm like, I don't know that that's going to be a thing in 20 years. No, <laughs> I hope not. Like, it's I don't, so uncomfortable to watch. It's so uncomfortable to walk. My wife hates it when my stepdad and dad did it. Right. I, I don't see myself doing it. I don't see any of my friends doing it. And so it's just like things like that, that are subtle that I don't know are going to be that way anyway. So then I had like, I had a weird reflection on this because like, if that's the only way though, that they have learned to be in relationship with women and we're not allowed to do that, but we're also not really talking to women at the same time. What have we lost because we're not talking to each other? Like, how are we, are we just going to be transactional, <laughs> right? Just, just give me my food and I'll give you the tip and we'll walk out. Like what, like there might be something lost in that because, oh, interesting. um, because where's like, how are we going to like 20 years from now? I just treat, I just honestly, I don't know. If, I'm not saying I'm better. I just treat everyone the same. Yeah. Like uh, I joke with absolutely every single person, male, female. I, I mean, maybe if you're younger, I'll, I'll tailor kind of my message. And if you're older, I might model and mass, like model a little bit near and match a little bit more. But I feel like the, the thing to do with is just to treat everyone the same. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, largely what I do, right? There are some, um, there's some code switching depending upon what goes on, right? Cause that's just a natural thing going on. But I was just thinking about like, if they weren't allowed to do that, if they, if that wasn't appropriate, would they know how to be? Ah, uh, would they have the tools, the voice, the language, the skill sets to be able to communicate if they, if suddenly, which it has been, been made, uh, un- cool. Yeah. Um, you just can't do it. So it's yeah. like, I just get my order and go. And now they feel lonely. I mean, there's a whole thing and I'm not, please everyone. I'm not trying to justify said behavior, right? I'm not trying to do any of that. I'm just paying attention to how we're in relationship with each other. Right. And, and what that, how that cashes out. So you mentioned a bunch of times, you know, this definitely didn't go the way that we planned. And for all of our listeners and viewers, this is the second time we're having this conversation because uh, the first time there was a technical issue, uh, which which is kind of my bad. This is very different than the first conversation we had a few months ago. <laughs> and and I love it. But like in your mind, I, I don't usually ask people this. In your mind, what conversation did we just have? Like, like what would you call this? And like, are we are we good? Did we pull a pin on it? It feels like such a big conversation and 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 an unanswerable question that like I can usually tell when we're wrapping up. I don't know. I don't know how to even wrap this one up. So what you're asking me is to help you write the show notes. I see how this where this yeah. is going. Yeah, yeah. I'm outsourcing it to you because you're a professional podcaster and a best-selling author. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is is there more? Is there more for us to say on this? Um, what? Especially wh why do we? So I'm going to ask the question here, right? Because this again coming from some other trainings that I've been in and really, really successful facilitation. Is there's a there could just be the the guideline between us that like what if we just accept that there's not going to be closure on it? Like why do we have to close the issue? I just always like to make sure that, you know, if, if you're hitting this point in the podcast and you're still with us, that we've given you some real value, that there's been some tactical insight, that it's been entertaining. I think we've, we've checked a bunch of those things. 
I don't know. I'm I'm kind of a conclusion kind of guy. Like, how do we how do we wrap a bow on this or whatever? Do you know what I'm, you know what I mean? I do. I do know what you mean. So here's what here's what I'm thinking on this one. Um, listener, I hope you found this useful or at least <laughs> provocative. It helps you think about the world and how you're navigating it. If you, no matter where you're coming from, I hope it helps you think about this journey that other people are on with you and how you can participate in everyone doing their best work. Right. Um, that's really where that's, this all... That's leadership right there. Yeah. Like you've and, just literally described leadership. And so just being able to pause and sometimes be able to say, hmm, the way they're they're experiencing what we're going through may be different. Maybe I should, in this interaction, pause and check in about that, right? Or at least not assume they see the world the way that I see it. So many of the bumps that happen, I talk about this in Team Habits, right? There's a way I talk about team friction where it's like, Mark is a butthole and he always does this to me and blah, blah, blah. And then Charlie is such a blah, blah, blah. And we're going at each other. But if we were working in fast food or we were working in like, you know, the service industry, you bump into each other all the time, right? You just do. You, you step on someone's toe. You'll run around a corner. Like all these things happen and they're just bumps as a part of the work. Sometimes people get creepy and weird with it, but you know the difference between when it's creepy and weird and when it's just like you're moving fast and you bumped into each other. Sometimes what we're talking about here is if you're bumping into folks, you'd be like, hey, wait a second. Maybe it's not about them thinking about the world the way that I'm thinking about the world. They're thinking about the world in their own way that might not be what, so maybe I need to figure that out first mm. before I assume anything about their character or their intentions, right? Um, and also, no matter what work we do, as much as we might try to be stoics and compartmentalize and all those different types of things, we bring our whole life with us, right? And you don't know what someone is facing outside of the conversation outside of that edit that you just gave them on a document, outside of whatever. And so it turns out, this happens with my clients, happens with our community, happens with me. The more you can pause and not think that the world is exactly the way you think it is, the more you create some softness and grace and space for who you are and what you're doing to really emerge. And so many of us have set our schedules and have accepted a productivity model that has us on what I call pressure cooker productivity. We're, we're pomodoroing and we're, we're tracking every six minutes and we're like bah, 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 crunching it and all that sort of stuff. Pressure cooker creativity is typically not our best creativity. Turns out crock pot, <laughs> crock pot creativity and productivity is where some of the most magical stuff happens. Right. But to do that, you have to change some of the paradigms that you're walking in. You have to give some of this space. You have to give yourself space to be human and the people around you to be human. And once you do, those humans will create their best work by themselves or in a team. And that best work will help them thrive. <laughs>